Ray, major shift in gears. So uh, we're not, you're never done talking about kinetics and mechanism um, and kinetic tools, uh, but we're shifting over to radical based mechanisms in the class now. So uh, we'll talk today about structure and reactivity and then on Friday, which is the last day of class, we'll spend more time talking about uh, reactions and useful transformations of radicals. And so let's start off by focusing on how we represent radical mechanisms and we're going to make a shift from this very powerful arrow pushing that we've been using throughout this class and throughout Chemistry 201 and we're going to switch over to something uh, that we refer to as half arrows or fish hook arrows because they kind of resemble fish hooks. And the most important thing about, thing about half arrows is we're solely using them as a way to keep track of electrons. Okay, here was a bond. Where did those two electrons go? Oh, I've got two electrons. They get together and form a bond. And importantly, that means they do not represent the interaction of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals. <sighs> so that's really disappointing because it's really powerful that regular arrows <coughs> represent the interaction of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals. So that's too bad. And there's no simple way, and maybe we'll talk about why you can't get around this. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about, I think, five or six fundamental elementary reaction processes that you're going to see with radicals. And the first reaction, so hopefully you've all had in sophomore organic chemistry some sort of radical. Um, you start off learning SN2 and E2 and E1 and SN1, then you do a little bit of olefin addition, and then they stop and teach you radicals and then you never use them again after that chapter on radicals. And so hopefully you all have seen this type of radical process before. This is bond homolysis. It's just having a regular covalent bond pop apart to give two radicals. That's a pretty standard process. So we say in this way the bond homolyzes and we use two half headed half arrows here uh, to represent this homolysis. There's a bond with two electrons. One electron goes to this bromine, the other electron goes to that bromine. That's what that, those fish hook, those half arrows mean. So here's another common process and that's when you abstract an atom. You pull an atom off of some other, from some other bond. So here's the tin radical. We're going to see a lot of those, especially in the next lecture. And in this particular reaction, this tin is going to abstract a bromine atom. But the way I represent that is I show that there's two electrons in this bromine R bond and that bond's going to break. And we use half arrows to show what happens to those two electrons in that, in that carbon bromine bond. One electron comes over here and interacts with this radical on tin. The other electron in that carbon bromine bond goes back to the alkyl group. And so this is the correct way to use those half arrows. And the terminology we use is that we use the term abstraction. Uh, we're abstracting a bromine atom. If you look at the transition state, it's not obvious from those fancy fish hook arrows, but the transition state for this reaction is totally linear. So in other words, this looks kind of like a proton transfer or, or an SN2 reaction. It's a linear reaction, but that kind of gets lost in all of these fish hooks here, that ab abstracting atoms involves a linear transition state. Okay, so let's look at uh, uh, three more fundamental elementary type reaction processes. So here's a reaction you probably saw in sophomore organic chemistry, uh, perhaps not with, uh, not with thiols <clears throat> or not with thiol radicals, and that's addition to olefins. And so we're adding to the CC double bond and you can tell that we're adding to the less substituted end. We refer to that as anti-Markonikov addition. And the way we represent that is we're clearly breaking a pi bond here. And so we have to show where the electrons in that pi bond go using these half arrows. I'm going to take one of the electrons in this pi bond and then I'm going to take one of the uh, electrons or the, the lone pair from this thiol radical and when you, when you form a bond like this, note what's happening with these half arrows. You show that they meet in the middle to form a new bond. That's the way to use fish hook arrows is they, they'll meet together to form a new bond. And then there must have been one more electron uh, in, this, in this pi bond. I'll start from the top here and I'll show that that other electron in the pi bond ends up on this more substituted carbon atom. So you get the more stable radical in the end. You're going to have a tendency to do this and I'm, I'm going to draw it in a different color because I want to make clear that this is wrong, right? You're going to be writing out all your fish hook arrows and then you're suddenly going to find yourself wanting to do something like this. Oh yeah, that radical attacks it. That's totally wrong, right? That's not what I'm showing you. At no point ever are you going to have a radical add to an atom like this. That's an incorrect use of half arrows. 
The point is we're supposed to be showing where electrons go. They either form bonds or they go back to an atom. You don't use dots to attack things. That's not the way we use fish hook arrows. Even though that makes sense to me, because it harkens back to this idea that you add to filled or unfilled orbitals. Um, so you have to avoid that kind of temptation to make radicals, make fish hooks add into atoms. Okay, so let's take another example uh, of a common elementary reaction process. <clears throat> Here's a common type of radical that's stabilized by, it's not the heteroatom, it's the lone pairs on that heteroatom that will stabilize this. We call this a ketyl radical. Um, it kind of looks like it's derived from a ketone, if, if you don't think about the R group. And I'll draw just two of these things getting together. <clears throat> and we call this recombination, or we say that they recombine. <clears throat> ah, that just feels so good, right? Carbon wants an octet of electrons, and this is just screaming pain at me. But whenever carbon radicals can combine together to form a bond, you satisfy the octet rule for both the atoms. Those are always fast. Radical recombination events are always fast, um, specifically if they form carbon-carbon bonds, and most other types of bonds. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that. Okay, what's the last type of, uh, I guess I shouldn't call this an elementary react. oh, let me draw the arrow, the fish hook arrow pushing. There we go, there's a radical and another radical and they combine to give a new bond. That's the correct usage of fish hook arrows. Okay, the last reaction is not really a reaction. I'm just going to show the use of these half arrows to represent resonance. You can use them to, in most cases, to predict resonance structures. So I'll draw a double-headed uh, resonance arrow instead of a reaction arrow. And, and if I wanted to explain why allyl radicals are stable, I can use these half arrows to do that. I just need to show somehow how uh, I break this pi bond and, and, and make a new pi bond on the other side. So I'll take <clears throat> this electron and use one of these half arrows. Let me be a little more careful here and make it sure it's clear that it's ending at this bond. And then I'll take one of the electrons from this pi bond and I don't like having those arrows touch. So let me be really careful and picky about that. Um, and so two of these electrons here are joining together to make a pi bond. And since I broke that pi bond, I have to do something with that remaining electron in the pi bond. I'll give it there to the end. So this is resonance. You can use half arrows for, to show elementary reaction mechanisms, or you can show them to, to represent um, <clears throat> resonance structures. Now there's one important type of resonance where these half arrows are no good, and it's going to frustrate you. It's going to frustrate you infinitely, and I'm sorry about that. Because one of the most important types of stabilized radicals are radicals that are stabilized by adjacent lone pairs. Here's an example of one. And again, this is an example of a ketyl radical. It looks kind of like it was derived from a ketone. It's got an extra electron in there. And an important resonance structure for these types of ketyl radicals or any radical that has a lone pair next door. It could be an amino group next door. Just something with a lone pair is what I'm trying to get at. Things with lone pairs can donate into that radical center and stabilize it. And so there's another important resonance structure you can draw that looks like this. Notice what I've done is I've picked up an electron from this oxygen and then I've moved it onto the carbon atom. And I promise you there is no half arrow or other arrow pushing you can do to show how you get between these resonance structures. Let's try to do it just to show how insane that would look. Let's try to go backwards since I've got this over on this side. If I tried to do some sort of arrow pushing, how would I do that? Let's just suppose I take this, this single electron here and then show that this, it can combine with this other electron here. I'll get a resonance structure. I don't even know how to draw this. It just looks so, so crazy. Oh, there's that nice pi bond there. Things are looking good with that carbon. But what about that other electron? There's still another electron on the carbon, right? That doesn't look good. There's nothing about that. There's no, so the bottom line is you do have resonance, but you can't represent the resonance using ha those half arrows. You just have to draw the resonance structure. And don't try to use half arrows to explain why lone pairs can stabilize radicals that are adjacent. Um, so, so there is resonance, and it's very powerful. Just don't represent that with half arrows. Okay, so. Those are the types of elementary reactions we're going to be doing 
um, in this uh, in this section of the course. I want to start off by uh, talking about bond dissociation energies and we used to cover this in uh, the first part of this uh, two-quarter sequence chem 201. I don't know if we still cover this uh, in that section um, but I'll just say a little bit about this. <clears throat> There's a process called bond dissociation and it specifically refers to a homolytic process, homolysis. So by definition if you talk about the bond dissociation energy for an alkyl H bond, ethyl H, methyl H, cyclohexyl H. The bond dissociation energy is defined as the enthalpy required to homolyze this bond to give two independent radicals. So this is the definition of a bond dissociation energy. It's the enthalpy change associated with this process. The standard state enthalpy change is, is the bond dissociation energy. And that's the definition. As a consequence of this definition, we use the, the phrases weak bond or strong bond specifically in reference to BDEs, to bond dissociation energies or bond energies, sometimes more short, in, in shorter format called a bond energy. It's this process here that allows us to define a weak bond and a strong bond. And the reason why that's strange is you're going to run into processes where uh, like this, that you know are fast. If you take butyl lithium or some carbanion, you know that it's very screaming fast uh, for a, an alkyl anion to deprotonate water, for an unstabilized, that's fast. But that doesn't mean that this is a weak bond. In fact, this is one of the strongest bonds that we're going to encounter. All of the stuff that you know about proton transfer rates don't relate to weak or strong bonds. By definition, the bond strength relates to this process, cleaving apart to give radicals. And what you would find is that this process here would be incredibly slow. So this would be fast, you know that's fast, but you're not going to find any radicals plucking hydrogen atoms off of water or ethanol or, or simple alcohols. Right, this is a slow process. That's because this bond is strong by definition here. That's a strong bond. It's not strong towards proton abstraction, it's strong towards processes that leave sucky looking OH radicals, hydroxyl radicals. That's why that's slow when we get right down to it. Okay, so don't confuse weak and strong bond um, with, with acidity. It's a completely different concept. Radicals and anions are completely different types of species. That, Bond dissociation energies are very powerful. Uh, they're very powerful for estimating what types uh, of reactions are enthalpically favorable. There's a simple way to account for enthalpy changes in reactions. Sum up all the bonds broken and subtract all the bonds that you formed and you can come up with an estimate uh, of enthalpy change. Uh, but, but here for radical chemistry, uh, the importance is that if you look at bond dissociation energies and compare them, they tell you about radical stability. So if we compare a bunch of BDEs, for example, for bonds to hydrogen, if you look at the bond dissociation energies and compare them, they tell you about the stability of X dot. Whether X is an ethyl group, a hydroxyl group, doesn't matter. Because the other side of the equation is always H dot. We can kind of subtract out the instability of an H dot radical. And let me just say, you are never going to find any kind of a process um, in organic chemistry where H dot is floating around in your reaction. There is no such real process where H dot just floats around. You're not going to have any processes where H dot just pops off. You can abstract an H dot group, um, but there's no, um, I'll just write not a, a species. 
It's kind of like a functional group in organic chemistry. If you fly into the center of the sun where the temperature is a billion degrees, yeah, you've got H dot there, but not in your reaction. You don't have H dot ever floating around. Okay, so in other words, the, this is just a hypothetical process. There's not really ever any process where you just pop off to have H dot flying around. But by thinking about this hypothetical process, we can compare um, by knowing differences in bond dissociation energies, they're really telling us about differences in the stability of this. Okay, so let's look. Um, <clears throat> let's just uh, make a, a general statement first about the stability of radicals. And that is that more stable radicals tend to be less reactive. Most of the time that holds true in organic chemistry. Not all the time, there's a few cases. But for radicals, when you try to think about how, how reactive radicals are, generally more stable equals less reactive. So here's what we learn by looking at bond dissociation energies. Here's what we learn about radical stability. I'll show you some trends. And I'm going to start off by looking at trends, or a simple trend that would be predicted by electronegativity. I'm not going to show you everything in the second row, but I'll just show you two obvious examples. If you compare the, the reactivity of an oxygen-based radical versus a carbon-based radical, well, oxygen is more electronegative. I, I promise you it does not want to have one of its electrons removed. It's electronegative. There's more protons in the nucleus of oxygen. If you were an electron, you'd want to hang around an oxygen nucleus. So if you look at the stability, a carbon-based radical should be way more stable than an oxygen-based radical if everything else is equal. Like this is just a one atom system right here. So in fact, you're going to find very few things that look like this. That's not to say we couldn't add substituents that could try to stabilize that. But you're not going to see hydroxyl radicals floating around in your reaction mixture. Um, Maybe if you have gamma ray sources or something, you, you might generate stuff like that. And the difference is, is pretty phenomenal. Just looking at the bond dissociation energies, there's a table that I, I have in the online notes where I have a whole set of bond dissociation energies. And if you compare those bond dissociation energies, it's about 10 orders of magnitude more stable, 10 to the 10th more stable to have a radical on carbon versus a radical on oxygen. Let's take a look at what happens when you compare hybridization. And the differences are huge here. So I'm going to start off by drawing an sp hybridized radical. <clears throat> and I'll compare that to an sp2 hybridized radical versus an sp3 hybridized radical. And we have an idea what happens as you add s character. The more s character, let's just note that this is sp hybridized sp3 hybridized, and in the middle is sp2. So sp hybridized orbitals are low in energy. sp hybridized orbitals are low in energy. It's hard to take an electron out of a low energy orbital. Electrons want to be in low energy orbitals. It's easy to take an electron out of a high energy orbital. They're high in energy. They don't want to be, electrons don't want to be in high energy orbitals. More p character makes this orbital higher in energy. It's easier to take an electron out of there. It's just really hard to take electrons out of low energy orbitals. So it's kind of an obvious, in a way, an obvious sort of thing. And again, the, the differences in reactivity here, uh, I'll show you the bond dissociation energies for the CH bond. Um, you have to imagine what would happen if I put the, 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 uh, for the H back on there. These aren't just tiny differences. So these are actual differences for acetylene versus ethylene versus ethane. Right? So how many times more stable is this sp3 hybridized bond than the sp2 hybridized bond? These are kcals per mole, by the way. 12 kcals per mole. What does that mean in stability? What does 12 kcals per mole mean in factors of 10? Yeah, it's about 10 to the 9. So an sp3 hybridized or, uh, uh, radical is about 10 to the 9 more stable. What about sp versus sp2? How many factors of 10 is that? I'm too stupid to do this math, but it's 21 kcals per mole divided by 1.4. 
It's a huge number. 10 to the what, what is the? 21, 1. It doesn't matter. It's like 10. It's more than 10 to the 10th more stable. You're not going to have reactions that have alkyno radicals floating around. Right? That, that kind of bond is so strong. Um, you're just not going to have alkyno radicals. There's no simple reactions to make those um, that are common in organic chemistry. OK, so that's uh, electronegativity. That's hybridization. Hybridization is phenomenally important, right? The hybridization is more important than whether it's oxygen or, or carbon, actually. Okay, and the last thing is resonance and the ability of resonance to affect. Um, radical stability. And so if we look at, at something that is completely unstable, I'm just for the sake of making things a little different, going to switch over to oxygen-based radicals, but our, our thinking will, will translate here. <clears throat> and so let's compare a hydroxyl-based radical with a radical that has a methyl group on there. And the important thing about methyl group is that there's CH bonds that can donate into unfilled orbitals. And if there's only one electron, that's not totally filled. There's some orbital that's only halfway filled. And so even a, a crummy donor like CH can donate a little bit in, into this half-filled orbital here. We'll talk more about that shortly. So just putting a methyl group, anything with a bond on it will be able to add a little bit of stabilization. And the more alkyl groups you can put on there, the more stable, stabilized that that will be. So it's an example of a CH bond that can donate into and stabilize that radical. And if we look at the bond association energies, um, for the OH bond that we would have had to, to homolize to give that, it's 118 versus 101. So 17 kcals per mole. So what is that, 10 to the 12, 12 orders of magnitude more stable, just that tiny little CH bond there in terms of the stabilization you get. <clears throat> what if we put a better donor on there? I'm not calling this as a great donor. A carbonyl group, there's a pi bond here. And this is not the most nucleophilic pi bond in the world, right? But there's a, a pi bond here, a CO pi bond, that can donate into that radical and stabilize it. You normally don't think of CO pi bonds as being donors. Usually you think of those as being acceptors, right? It's kind of odd there. <clears throat> and then if we compare that, I, I think it's kind of obvious that if you have a regular CC pi bond, that that would be a better stabilizer for a radical. <clears throat> That's a more stable radical than a carboxylate radical. It doesn't matter whether it's formate or, or benzoate or I'll just put an R group here to make it kind of generic so that you can see what we're talking about. And then finally I'll come over here and, and just put a lone pair donor. Right? How can it get better than a lone pair? Maybe I could have a, a nitrogen lone pair here, but you know, the important point is it's, I've got a lone pair here that can donate into that and I'll just write non-bonding orbital on oxygen. So as, you, as the donors that we put next to that radical get better and better, the stability of that radical really improves. In fact, you're going to find a lot of processes that involve this hydroperoxy radical. And it looks crazy. It's like, what? Oxygen radical? That's totally unstable. Well, if you put a lone pair donor next to it, it, it you can actually stabilize that. Even though it's an oxygen-based radical and we know oxygen loves its electrons. So let me fill you in with the uh, bond association energies here. Uh, these are about 112 for the, uh, actually I've cut that out of, out of place for the, uh, I've got that out of place because oxygen is not a great, um, <clears throat> because oxygen, carbonyls are not very good donors, right? Carbonyl group double bonds are not very good donors. I should have had this one over here. But a regular pi bond is a great donor, so that's more stabilizing than a CH bond. And then finally, the lone pair on an oxygen, that's an incredibly stabilized radical there. Right? The lone pair is on, on oxygen. So I should have put this one over here um, in front of this CH bond, because CO pi bonds are not very stabilizing. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and give you some more, a, a few more quantitative numbers so that I can highlight what are some of the weak bonds that we should think about breaking. Right? When you can break weak bonds, that ought to be a good, um, homolytically, if the bond really is weak, then it ought to be able to 
in order to be possible to break those bonds in radical reactions. So let's compare some, some bond dissociation energies. I'm just going to start off by giving you an average carbon-carbon bond energy. Right? It depends on the hybridization of those atoms. Uh, there's a huge dependence on the hybridization. 83 kcals per mole. It's going to be very rare for you to simply see carbon-carbon bonds fly apart to give radicals. That's going to be rare. Even if you, maybe if you hit things with light or something in the right circumstance. But let me compare that to average numbers, for example, for a carbon-bromine bond. And I say average because it depends on whether it's t-butyl or methyl or phenyl. I'm just giving you kind of an average number um, for carbon bromine or carbon iodine. Carbon bromine is 69. Carbon iodine is 57. These are numbers that are starting to get low enough. If you've got the right radical, you can pull that halogen off of the carbon with the right radical, like a tin radical. We're going to see lots of examples of that. <clears throat> Okay, let's look at some really weak bonds. I'm going to give you a very specific energy for hydrogen peroxide. You can buy hot bottles of hydrogen peroxide. Um, at the store, don't heat peroxides because they will homolyze. So you give radicals. Don't put them in the light. That'll induce homolysis. That's a weak bond. Let's look at some more weak bonds. Notice that these are heteroatom, heteroatom bonds. Generally quite weak. So bromine, bromine. You see a lot of radical reactions with Br2. You can get those to homolyze. Not quickly, but you can get them to homolyze. Iodine iodine bonds, very weak. So 36 kcals per mole. <clears throat> okay, so uh, last couple of sets of bonds here I'll, I'll show you. Let's just compare um, an alcohol with a thiol. So very difficult to pull hydrogen atoms off of alcohols. You're not going to see that happen. It's not that it's impossible, but it's always easier to pull the H off of here. If you pull the H off the carbon, you get a lone pair stabilized carbon radical. So you just don't expect to ever see pulling off this bond. But for a thiol, no problem pulling off the H from a thiol. The SH bond is weaker than the bond of the carbon atom next to sulfur. <clears throat> so here you pull the proton off of carbon, but here you pull the proton off of the sulfur. Very common for, um, for reactions that are going on inside of the cell. So this is a third row atom, sulfur. If we drop further down in the periodic table to tin, now we're seeing reagents that are very useful in organic chemistry. Um, I, I guess I would include the thiol in, in this. Um, but these next two species that I'm giving you are common H bond donors in organic reactions. The tin H bond is weak enough, you're going to see many reactions where R dot plucks the H off. And this just serves as an H donor in many radical reactions. So expect this weak bond to make this very useful um, as an H donor. So it can trap out radicals. Some people don't like tin because it's toxic. If you don't like tin because it's toxic, you can use this fancy, super fancy newfangled, it's not newfangled anymore. It just looks really crazy. It's like, why would you use this thing? The bond association energy is not that different. It's just because if you want to avoid tin, you can use this. It's a common reagent. You can buy it from suppliers just like you can buy the tin hydrides. So if you don't like the toxicity of tin, you can switch these this tris trimethyl silo. <laughs> Look at all these silicon silicon bonds. You've never seen anything like that before. Um, <clears throat> but those bonds are weak, and you can switch over to those if you don't like the toxicity of tin. Okay, let's uh, think about frontier orbitals. We've got all these bond dissociation energies. How do we think about the structure of radicals? Maybe the way the trajectories, the way they interact with other molecules, the orbital interactions. I'm going to draw, um, I'm going to go ahead and draw a representation of a simple alkyl radical. There's a carbon atom in between. And a simple alkyl radical looks kind of like this. They're slightly pyramidal. 
When I say slightly pyramidal, that also means they're slightly flat. It's not quite flat, but close to flat. And there's a very small inversion barrier here. So you're not going to have a configurationally stable R or S enantiomer of a simple alkyl radical. It's very slightly pyramidal and the inversion to inverting through that P orbital is very low. So you, um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, you can assume it's going to react from the top and the bottom. Um, not exactly with equal facility, but essentially equal facility. It'll, it'll go back and forth very quickly. Okay, so <clears throat> that's kind of the structure. Let's take, take a, uh, start to think about trajectories for addition of different species to pi bonds. And I'll just remind you uh, of, of some of the stuff that you already know. I want to contrast some trajectories for addition. Uh, let's imagine the addition of a nucleophile to a pi bond. This is something you should have learned about last quarter. <clears throat> if you take some sort of a nucleophile and you add it to a, a pi bond, I think you all remember that the nucleophiles add from a 109 degree angle. This is called the Berge Dunitz angle. And the reason why nucleophiles add from that angle is because you're adding to pi star. And if we phase that, right, if you've got the right phasing to add with this hashed portion here, you want to avoid these unhashed parts of the pi star orbital. So when you're adding to pi star, um, you come in from this 109 degree angle. So I think you know that. Okay, what about electrophiles? If I take an electrophile, if I brominate a double bond, or chlorinate a double bond. That's totally different. We're not adding to pi star anymore if you have an electrophile coming in. If an electrophile is coming in, it's adding to pi. And so if we sketch out what pi looks like, right, pi has most of its electron density in the center, even though my drawing is kind of crummy here. Right? When you come in with bromine, you form a bromonium ion, and your angle of attack, if you measure the angles here, how do I, I'm sorry, I'm not good at drawing that carbon-carbon bond in the middle, but if you measure those angles, they're closer to 60 degrees than 109 degrees, right? If you measure this angle here, it, because it's, it's not a perfect equilateral triangle, so it won't be 60 degrees. In fact, it'll be a, um, a little bit, I'll, I'll write greater than or equal to 60 degrees. Right? It's not 90. It's, great. it's something greater than 60 because it's not all the sides aren't of equal length here. But it's not 109, right? That's, a, that's larger. It's like an obtuse angle there. Okay, so now let's compare this to a radical. What happens if a radical adds to an olefin? There's lots of reactions like this where you get anti-Markonikov addition of, of radicals to olefins. <clears throat> what you find when radicals add to olefins is you can get a variety of, of trajectories. And I'll go ahead and start off by drawing an R dot radical. Very commonly for simple alkyl radicals, ethyl, methyl, you get angles that are closer to 109 degrees. Kind of suggests it's adding to pi star, doesn't it? But then if you take really electron deficient radicals, like a BR dot radical, you find acute angles. So you'll find this whole variation in, in angles, whoops, let me just change this here. You'll find this whole variation in angles depending on whether you're interacting more with pi or pi star. And we'll talk about that in a second. So, and you have to think about that if you're trying to do stereoselective reactions where the key bond forming step involves addition of a radical to a pi bond. Um, the, the trajectories are not as simple um, as they are in these two cases. <clears throat> Depends on how, whether you're interacting more with pi or pi star. So let's talk about those interactions. Like what are, we, what are you interacting with when you add an electrophile to a pi bond? What are the frontier orbitals that are interacting? I'm going to start off by saying something so we don't forget it. Um, <clears throat> and let me change this from carbon. I'll just write R dot. So if you just have an alkyl radical, ethyl, methyl, butyl, if this is intrinsically, no matter what I say, just remember they're intrinsically electron deficient. Right? Every carbon atom wants an octet of electrons. 
But you can have different variations of electron deficiency. Really electron deficient or just kind of electron deficient. In fact, to the point where sometimes we call radicals nucleophilic and sometimes we call them electrophilic, even though they're all intrinsically lacking an octet. <clears throat> and so how do we think about this? How do we describe this? The key frontier orbital um, that we have to think about for a radical is called a singly occupied molecular orbital. or SOMO for short. And so let's try to think about the interaction diagram. What would it look like? How would we draw a molecular orbital interaction diagram where some sort of an R dot interacts with some sort of an alkene? And I'm going to take two extreme cases here. And I'm trying to judge whether I'm going to have room here on this. I'll try to fit it on this board. So here's case number one. We have R dot and we have an olefin. And then the R dot interacts with that olefin to form a bond. And, and we could put in the, the arrow pushing. We'll just change the colors because this isn't the arrow push. This, these half arrows are not really the focus here. Um, <clears throat> the focus is thinking about the molecular orbitals that are involved when we form, when we get that to interact <clears throat> with this carbon carbon pi system here. So I'm going to start off by drawing out my molecular orbital interaction diagram here. And over here on this side, I'm going to draw the orbitals for this R dot. There's going to be empty orbitals. There's going to be filled orbitals, lots of both. Um, but somewhere in the middle, I'm going to have an orbital. And it's not one of the bottom energy orbitals. I'm going to have some orbital that has only one electron in it. It's not filled. Filled orbitals have two electrons. It's not empty. It's not unfilled. It's singly occupied. So we can't really call that a LUMO or a HOMO. We have to give it this completely different name to represent the fact that it can either interact with a home, uh, uh, an occupied orbital or it can react with an empty orbital. This could be a donor because it's got an electron or it can be an acceptor. And so we're going to have to think about the interactions of both. Okay. Does this look nucleophilic or electrophilic to you? Yeah. That looks a Wait, that looks nucleophilic to me. <laughs> There's a lone pair on here that's amping up the energy of this pi system. That's a nucleophilic pi system. And so I want to draw out some sort of pi and pi star where they're both high in energy. So let me try to sketch this out here. And so here's the HOMO of this pi system. It's high in energy. And here's the LUMO. Right, this, isn't a, this isn't an interaction with the LUMO. It's some sort of an interaction with the HOMO of this pi system, the pi HOMO. And so let's try to draw this interaction. This is going to be the dominant interaction here. If I have two orbitals that are close in energy and, and they interact, I'll get two orbitals out. Two orbitals interact, I get two orbitals out of that process. So let's draw those two orbitals. One orbital has to be lower in energy and one orbital has to be higher in energy. And there's some my little interaction lines there. Okay, I had three electrons when I started. I've got to figure out what to do with those three electrons. I think there's some sort of Aufbau principle or something like that that says we've put those three electrons in starting at the bottom and then we keep adding as we go up. And something crazy comes out. It's like, wait a second. What happened here? How can that be a stabilizing interaction if this went up in energy? It seems like how could you possibly form a bond if the electrons end up higher in energy than you sort of, here's the secret to thinking about this. Okay, maybe this did go up by one electron volt, but these two electrons went down by one electron volt, right? One electron went up, but two electrons went down and that's why it's stabilizing. That's why it's favorable to interact with a HOMO, right? Overall, you, you benefit as long as these two, two um, species are going down in energy. And that makes sense. It's these two electrons, this is the nucleophile, they want to go into a lower energy orbital. So <clears throat> that's what's happening. So this would be an example of a SOMO-LUMO interaction or SOMO-HOMO interaction. Right? This is a, a kind of a nucleophilic alkene and it found something to do with the, those high energy electrons. Okay, so now let's take um, <clears throat> an alternative scenario. where I have an acceptor. So acrylonitrile looks like a classical acceptor. 
the arrow pushing looks exactly the same. Right? We don't, those half arrows look the same. You can't tell any difference based on the half arrows that I draw. <clears throat> and so this is going to be an example of a SOMO interacting with the LUMO of this acrylonitrile of this pi acceptor, LUM, LUM O. Okay, let's sketch out this orbital diagram. It's going to be the same R dot, just generically. I'm going to, I'll try to sketch that at the same level if I can. And the filled and un, totally filled and unfilled. So here's my SOMO. Let me label it. I forgot to label that SOMO over here, so let me label it SOMO so I have a label on my diagram. There's that SOMO. So now over here in this other case with acrylonitrile, I want to draw some low energy pi orbitals, pi and pi star. So I'm going to draw pi and pi star where my LUMO is now down here and the HOMO is way down here. So that's not going to get involved. That's so low in, that, that HOMO is so low in energy. Um, and so I want to think about this interaction now between my SOMO. And so if I take two orbitals and I mix them together, one orbital, I get two out. One that's higher, one that's lower. Here's my little interaction lines there. And now I, I've got one electron. I had two orbitals when I started and there was only one electron between the two of them. So I start filling that in. I feel like this is totally easy to see how that's a stabilizing interaction. Because it's like I start up here and then it ends up in a lower energy orbit. That seems easier for me to see when I look at that. Than, it's like, Gee, why is this stabilizing? This is the harder one to envision when you draw the MO diagram. Okay, so this is easy to see. This electron finds a better orbital to go into, essentially, is a way of, uh, an oversimplified way of thinking about that. Okay, so this is the frontier orbital analysis uh, for orbital interactions. And you kind of want, right, if you really wanted this interaction to be favorable, what you want is you want to have a small homo-lumo gap, right? If the difference here is small, the interaction energies you get get bigger and bigger. It's just the fundamental math. Right? If, this, if the difference between this SOMO and this LUMO gets smaller, the interaction energy gets bigger. And so what would I need to do to this R dot in order to make this a more favorable interaction? Right? What you really want to do is bring the energy of the SOMO down so it's closer to the HOMO. So in other words, you, if this is nucleophilic, you'd really like this to be electrophilic. That would be the fastest reaction. And if you really had a good electrophile here, you really want to bring this, the SOMO, the R dot SOMO up in energy in order to, to get a lot of interaction energy out. You want a nucleophilic radical if you want to have a fast reaction with an electrophilic radical. And so you can use your understanding of orbitals to predict which types of radical reactions will be fast and which type will be slow. So let's talk about variations on, on this kind of a theme here. Yeah. You get a, uh, I guess, more optimization, but you get a more like, reactive radical then. Because you are getting a more higher energy radical, right? Um, no, but, you, but thermodynamically it's favorable because you're breaking a pi bond. You're, yeah. you're trading off a CC pi bond for a CC single bond. Yeah, I mean, like, the radical form kind of goes on. Yeah, that one particular around. orbital is more, is higher in energy, but the overall molecule is more stable. Okay. And that's common in, in, to have situations like that, where one orbital can be higher in energy even if the overall molecule is more stable. Yeah, so, so there's lots of other interaction, like there's lots of unfilled orbitals here. It's interacting with all of them. The overall, when you add up all the orbitals that you get, interacting this with every unfilled orbital, this with every filled and unfilled orbital, this with every filled orbital, the overall molecule will be more stable. <coughs> Okay, let's push this a little further to analyze this interaction of alkyl radicals uh, with olefins. And I'm going to start off by looking how, at how variations in R can affect the rates of addition to this type of a radical species. And so this is an example where we have a reaction that looks like this. <clears throat> and so what happens is we vary R dot. I'm going to give you some relative rate constants here for addition of ethyl radicals isopropyl radicals and T-butyl radicals. 
I think you can guess what's going to happen to the nucleophilicity of this as I add more and more sigma bond donors. Each one of these alkyl groups has sigma bonds that can donate into that orbital and raise the energy. If these were carbanions, you'd expect more and more nucleophilic things to come out of that. And if you look at the relative rates, as I make R dot more and more nucleophilic, the rates increase, right? In spite of the fact that T-butyl is more sterically hindered, it's still faster. <clears throat> All of these donors on here, there's, let me draw this out. There's H sigma donors on here that donate into that and make that more reactive, that raise the energy of, the, of that system. So even though it's more sterically hindered, this is still faster because that's more nucleophilic. So there's variations in, right? All carbon radicals are nucleophilic, right? They're all electron deficient because they don't have an octet. But there's variations in how, um, I guess, how nucleophilic they are. It's this, it's this weird conundrum that, gee, I, it, isn't that electrophilic? It doesn't have a, an octet. Um, but there's, you know, there's, there's variations in nucleophilicity. Okay, so let's take a look at a single alkyl radical and compare uh, how the different <clears throat> enone acceptors or, or, carb or CC double bond acceptors affect the reactivity. <clears throat> so if you have a cyclohexyl radical, for example, and we look at, at double bonds that have variations in the R substituent, and we look at the, the relative rates. So as we vary that R substituent on our alkene, um, and we look at the, the relative rates, if R is just a methyl group, I'll assign that a relative rate of 1. If we put a, a conjugating group, conjugating groups lower the energy of the LUMO and raise the energy of the HOMO. The more conjugation you have, the more you lower the LUMO, the more you raise the HOMO. That's the effect of conjugation. So putting another conjugating group on here lowers the energy of the LUMO. Makes that a better interaction. <clears throat> if I put an even better acceptor on there, carboxyethyl, now that's an even better pi acceptor, even lower LUMO. <clears throat> and finally, cyano is, is one of the best. Um, so those, you get phenomenal rate differences, hundredfold rate difference as you switch uh, from just a simple alkyl to a cyano acceptor group. So cyano is one of the best. I don't think it should be a surprise then. Uh, next time you open up a bottle of super glue, and try to super glue something, but end up super gluing your fingers together. <clears throat> the reason why that reaction is so facile is that super glue has a cyano group on it. It's called cyanoacrylate, methyl cyanoacrylate. So there's two different acceptors on super glue. There's a cyano group and a methyl ester. And so once you expose that to any kind of R dot, it just takes a little bit of oxygen to get this process started. Um, once you give this a little bit of R dot, you're off and running here. You can't stop these kinds of additions from occurring. Um, you add once, and you get a new radical out. And now there's more cyanoacrylate there. <clears throat> and I'm not going to sh show, right, you get polymer. So that's the idea. That's the way methyl cyanoacrylate adhesives work. Crazy glue, Loctite, there's all, all, they're all the same thing. <clears throat> And the only way to stop that is to don't keep the oxygen out. It'll, it'll chain terminate eventually. Okay, let me come back to this idea of tuning the nucleophilicity of radicals. I'm going to give you a group of radicals that we could identify as nucleophilic easily identify as nucleophilic. So if you have donor groups, that's nucleophilic. Relative to just a, a, um, a, a simple radical, <clears throat> this is actually even more nucleophilic and, and a mean stabilized radical because nitrogen lone pairs are better donors. Even just a simple R group is considered um, a nucleophilic radical because there's CHs on you're not ever going to work with methyl radicals, but if you have any kind of an alkyl group on there, those CHs donate in, into that orbital and make that nucleophilic. <clears throat> and let's contrast that with electrophilic radicals. Where we have pi acceptors. 
right? I could draw an MO diagram w with this electron interacting with this carbonyl even though they're within the same molecule. I could draw an MO diagram just like I did before. It's the same type of MO diagram. So anything that has a traditional resonance acceptor is going to be a kind of electrophilic radical. And if you've got an electronegative atom, right, when you have electronegative atoms all the orbitals are lower in energy. And so you'd consider an RO dot to be an electrophilic radical. Okay, let's try to uh, take an example where we have a chance for competition to guide based on th those types of reactivity where I have a ch chance for competition to affect um, <clears throat> the outcome of the reaction. So nucleophilic radicals add fast to electrophilic olefins. And vice versa. Electrophilic radicals add to nucleophilic olefins. So let's go ahead and take an example of a case where there's a choice. If you take some sort of a radical, and it doesn't matter what radical you start with. If you take some sort of a radical here, in this case I'm starting with a nucleophilic one. <clears throat> we can give it a choice. And in this case if I simply mix together an equal mixture of these two olefins, vinyl acetate and acrylonitrile, this is a nucleophilic radical. So which of these two alkenes is it going to add to faster, the top or the bottom? Yeah, the top one. This is a, a, this is a nucleophilic pi bond. That lone pair makes it nucleophilic. This is a resonance acceptor. And so it turns out that it's faster to add to the top olefin. This is fast and this addition is slower. It's not impossible, it's just slower. And you only need a hundred or a thousand fold rate difference to, to make all the difference. And so the intermediate that you get out of this now looks like this. Oh, but now the radical's next to an electron withdrawing group. Now that's an electrophilic radical that we get. And as long as I didn't deplete all my reagent, let's just assume these weren't the last two molecules in my flask and there's still a mole of each floating around, we still are confronted with the same choice now. Okay, so now I have an electrophilic radical. Which olefin are we going to add to, the top or the bottom? It's going to be the bottom. That's the nucleophilic olefin. And so now this is the fast process. You can see what's going to happen here is you're going to end up with this alternation. And this is how you make alternating polymers. I'm just going to say et cetera, et cetera. You get an alternating copolymer co when you do this. So you just have to imagine this continuing infinitely, not infinitely. Okay, so that's an example of copolymerization. Okay, we don't have time to quite cover everything, I'm sorry, um, but we will on Friday. I think I'm probably just going to give a PowerPoint presentation on Fridays to make sure that we cover the last of that business. Uh, but you can feel free to look ahead at the next, the lecture notes for the next lecture because I think it will help with the problem set. Um, and uh, so I'll see you in the discussion section today. So please remember to bring a computer, most of you. Um, we need each group, discussion section group, to have at least one computer among you.